oxygen dissociation is the tendency of oxygen to leave behind uh, hemoglobin. That's what it means. How likely is that to happen? Now, kind of what I want to do here is just sort of show you this graphically. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got this graph here on the x-axis. X-axis, we've got the partial pressure of oxygen. So whether it's kind of you know a very hot, high partial pressure to the uh, environment around it, and also on the y-axis, we've got percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. So the first thing I want you to realize is that if I was to sketch a dotted line kind of up here, this point here represents what we would call arterial blood okay this is arterial blood now let's just reflect on that for a second what does that mean it is blood that's in the arteries therefore it's oxygenated blood therefore the saturation of hemoglobin is complete it's typically between 97 and 100 percent we also know that because the saturation is complete it has a very high partial pressure because it has no other uh, um, it has no partially permeable membrane where it can actually then um, uh, pass over to another substance. So there is effectively 100% partial pressure because there is no other side of the membrane. In this case, of course, the walls of the arteries are in the, are themselves uh, non-permeable or impermeable. Now, what we're going to do from this point forward is we're going to represent that with what is a very, very simple green line. What we're saying here is in arterial blood, we have 100% partial pressure of oxygen, but we also have 100% hemoglobin saturation. Now where this gets interesting is where we now, this next part of this area here is going to be the arrival at a capillary bed, okay? So if you can imagine now that what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna bring in the next part of the curve here. Now this here, anything after this point here where we get into this purple or this pink, this is gonna be arrival at the capillary. So of course at this point, we're starting to get a partial pressure. In other words, the partial pressure is going down because we've got a partially permeable membrane. Now what's happening here is that we're starting to now get the dumping or the dissociation of oxygen into those tissues. And of course, if I was to complete that curve, there'd be this little section at the end that's not really important to us. Now the point I wanna make at this is this one. If I was to draw another dotted line in here, and I, you know, why wouldn't I? Um, if I was to draw another dotted line in here, I might draw it somewhere like here, okay? And what we've got now is this is what we would describe as venous blood. So this point here, this point here represents the saturation of hemoglobin in venous blood, the blood in the veins, and we're saying it's at some X percent over here. We've got some percentages, that let's call it 70% for argument's sake. Okay, now what that therefore means is that we have now had a delivery of oxygen into the tissue. So from here, bring that dotted line across, this area here, this area here represents, this area here represents oxygen delivered. And I wanna be really clear here, what I've just drawn in would be at resting levels, okay? Now, this is where life gets interesting. And let me just, before we go any further, let me just draw back. So what we're saying here is that we have arterial blood. As the, as the blood arrives here at the capillary bed, this oxygen is being dumped into, let's say the muscle, let's say the muscle of the neck as it holds our head up. So this this oxygen is being pumped is being dumped into the into the muscle and the other and the other organs and actually until this point this is now what we call the level of venous blood and anything below that of course you know would be would essentially be unhealthy now this is where it gets where life gets interesting if we start to exercise the following things occur we get around the muscle we get a lower pH we get for example and this contributes, of course, the presence of CO2. We get, for example, the presence of lactic acid. We know, for example, that, that we get an increase in temperature. Now, the point I wanna to make to you about all of those is that these factors, what they do is effectively, they shift our curve to the right. Okay, so if I now draw this curve, we might get something slightly different. We might now get something like this. My curve now comes like this, it comes up, it comes up, and then it goes in here. Now, the point I wanna make, we've now got this shift to the right of this curve. Now, the point I wanna make now is that this here now, this, if you look at where our venous blood is, here it is, at this point here now, we've now 
this now represents our venous blood. In other words, what we've got now is that the quantity of oxygen, or the percentage of oxygen, which is now being dumped into the muscle is far greater. So this is O2 delivered during exercise. Now this is a really interesting point because what we're saying here is that during exercise conditions, if the pH is lower because of the presence of CO2 and lactic acid, and if the temperature is higher, which of course is intrinsically going to be the case because we are in an exercise condition, we, we are releasing and transferring that energy, therefore that energy is, is, um, uh, is exothermic and therefore releases heat. What that means is that our blood becomes better able at uh, letting go of oxygen, oxygen dissociation, it releases more oxygen from hemoglobin and more hemoglobin is passed therefore into the muscle tissue. Now that is really, really useful. Now we can call this shift the bore shift. Okay, the bore shift. And the bore shift explains why during lower pH or more acidic conditions because of CO2 and lactic acid presence and at higher temperatures, the curve shifts to the right and therefore we get a greater delivery of oxygen into the muscle because the oxygen dissociates more readily from the hemoglobin. I hope that's clear enough for you. Thanks for listening.